So we have the same can, we just have no top lid. So we can use the exact same setup we had from before. We still have a radius, we still have a height. Area equals, we call it what? Outside or something? Area equals circumference times H plus one lid. And it's the same as before. This is 2 pi r h plus lid is pi r squared. We just don't have a 2 pi r squared. So we only have one lid. So now I want you to finish this problem. It's almost exactly the same as the last one. Before you take derivative, what do you have to do first? So we have, to, we have to use the leader, the one leader property, and get it either down to just H's or just R's. So last time we got down to R's, so let's get crazy and get H this time instead. So volume is one, that's pi R squared, well not pi to the R, pi R squared H, and I want to you know, because that r is squared, let's just go ahead. Let's do exactly what we did last time. It's easier to solve for h. Let's solve for h and then sub, sub that in. So we're going to substitute out the h for some function of r. So h is 1 over pi, 1 over pi r squared. And once you have that function of r only, take an r derivative, set it equal to 0, tell me what r value you get. It's not going to be the same as the r value for the first part uh, problem, because we don't have a second lid, so they can change its shape a little bit. I believe the radius gets a little bigger and the height gets a little smaller. It's a good time to ask questions. I'll give you about two minutes to do this.
Yeah. Why did it become a multiplication for a negative two? So I factor, you're talking about this factoring of the, oh, yeah, okay. I switched the order, because yeah. I just like to go positive first, negative second, I and I skip. You took the two out, I didn't see that you took the two out. Yeah, they both had two. These numbers are obviously not, not the prettiest values. But if you had a calculator, you could get the decimal approximations and manufacture things that big. And we're in decimeters, I think. We talked about units yesterday, Friday, whatever day that was. We talked about how you get a liter in terms of linear measurements cubed. Oh. Ooh, um. So you're okay with this, that one right there? I took one when we put uh, the to solve for H. Yeah, to solve for H. Oh. Did I not? Yeah. Oh, I didn't square it. So that should have been times two right there, which would have been two thirds. Which would have been one minus a third, so that would have been one third and negative one third. Oh, there we go. Oh, so the can is, well, the radius is technically half the diameter, so it's, this gets a much wider can, you can tell right there. So if you drew it to scale, the height is the same as a radius, so this cam is going to look something like that. So the height is equal to the radius right there. So whatever amount you got for the height, you got the same amount for the radius. Which is not, I believe the height was not the radius on the previous one. All right, other questions before we move on? So the height and the radius are the same? Mm -hmm. Coincidence, so it was just very coincidental. Okay. So we had two lids before, the height was not the same as the radius. If I had a three lid can, if I had to make three lids for whatever reason, uh, it would be a different, and if I had to make no lids, that would be different also. Uh, so it just, it certainly wouldn't hold liquids very well. <laughs> We're going to do one more example, and this one is going to be more geometrical. So you're going to find that most of the problems have either an area or a volume involved. Some of them are a little bit more geometrical, where they talk about a minimized distance. This, actually, this next one is going to be an area also. But we did a distance problem before in the related rates. And I show you the distance formula there. It's the square root of the difference in the x's squared plus difference in the y's squared. So if you have a distance, you just use distance formula. So this next example, we have a rectangle inscribed in a semicircle of radius 2. What is the largest area the rectangle would have?
And what are the dimensions? So a semicircle is a half circle. And a half circle with a radius 2. So the smart ways to draw it, I think, are either on the upper half of the plane or on the left side or the right side. So let's just default to the upper half. How about that? Now our rectangle has to be inscribed inside Let me draw a really bad rectangle inside the circle, semicircle. Why is that definitely not the maximum area of a rectangle? Yeah, you can go, you can get a bigger radius and a bigger, or not a bigger radius, a bigger height and a bigger width. So you go all the way until your points are on the edge. Or it doesn't make sense. Oops, I want to undo that. So we're going to go all the way to touch the semicircle. Otherwise, go oh, further. Right angle has to be in the yeah. Okay. So we're going to take the points to literally be on the circle. Well, if it didn't have to be inside, it would be an infinite area. Yeah. So if there were no restrictions. So we'll call. Let's get creative. We'll call that x. How about that? That'll be x. And then this height will be y. So we don't have to get terribly creative right here, x and y. This is very nice because this point happens to have coordinates x, comma, y. How do we know if a point is on, this is not the unit circle, but if a point's on a semicircle of radius 2, what equation relates x and y and makes a circle? There we go. X squared plus, well, almost. So we do have X squared plus Y squared equals what number? Four. Equals 4 or 2 squared. So this is the radius squared. If we weren't at the origin, it would be X minus some amount squared and then Y minus some other amount squared. That's how we would shift it up or down, left or right. So this is our circle of radius 2. How do I ensure that we're on the upper half of it? The circle, the equation I wrote down is a full circle. How do I make sure I don't go to the bottom half? Sort of. What determines if I'm in the bottom half? If y is negative. So y is negative. So we'll make sure y, uh, y greater than 0. If y equals 0, it's kind of boring. You're going to have a 0 area right there. And the way I drew it, x should be bigger than 0. If x is less than 0, I would be talking about the point on the other side right there. So the point I chose, x, y, I chose x to be positive. So at least in our scenario, x and y should both be positive the way I drew it. Have I written a formula down for the area? So we have largest area. So I'm trying to maximize area, but I have no equation for area. So when I have an area equation, that's the one I'm going to take a derivative of. How do I get my area equation? Or, and yeah, so I'm trying to maximize the area of the rectangle. So I need an area of a rectangle. Yep, that'll be width, which is 2x. So we have x and x on the other side, and then a y. So area is 2xy. You could regroup 2x times y, but that's just 2xy. I'm almost ready to take a derivative and set it equal to 0. The problem is, do I take an x derivative or a y derivative? So I have two variables in here. 
let's <laughs> we need to take out one of the two variables normally I would say let's try to take out y but let's get a little crazy and take out x so we just have an equation in terms of y so if we pick a y that'll determine what x that we're using so I want to remove x how do I remove x before taking my derivative I could divide by x, but then when I take my y derivative, I still have an x hanging around, though. It will just be on the other side. What's that? Solve for x in the circular equation. There we go. So we're going to solve for x just like we did before. We had an uh, equation that had related our two quantities, and we're solving for one of them to eliminate the other one. So we're going to remove x. by solving for x right up here. So go ahead, solve for x, and then that should be hard to do. There is one tricky part. We got a plus or minus square root. Which one do we choose? We're going to go with positive. Not because we forgot to put plus and minus, but why do we choose positive? So the way we drew our x basically says we're going to go with positive x right there. So I want x to be positive, so it better be the positive square root of that stuff. Yeah, I'd be getting negative area then, but I'd be maximizing my negative area at that point instead of minimizing my positive area. Oh, or no, so mean, the opposite way. The gap between two and the end of x. So if I choose chose negative x here, I would actually be measuring x right. over there. So my area would be negative basically. So we're about to do some calculus, so we need to convert this to a half power. So just looking at this, we have a chain rule and a product rule happening. You can always do algebra to clean things up a little bit. Can I distribute my y inside? Why can I not distribute my y? They don't have the same exponential power. I could write it with y to the half power, but y to what power to the half power? So y squared to the half power. So if you really want to distribute, you can do it this way. And now I can distribute my y squared in. They both have a half power. I avoided a product rule here by doing that algebra. That algebra is not terribly obvious, though. So you may not have seen that algebra happen before. Or that, that was an option before. Which derivative are we taking now? We got equation with two variables. Which derivative are we taking? Which one? Y. A y derivative. If we were doing a related rates, I'd be taking a t derivative. But you need to know when you're doing rates versus optimization. We're doing optimization because somewhere it said largest. So if you see a largest, smallest, anything with an ist, basically, superlative, you're doing optimization. All right, take this y derivative. Do it carefully, you, you still have some serious chain rule ha happening, even though there's no product rule to worry about. It's still not an easy derivative. I'll do the left side.
So any derivative questions? I just noticed that 2 cancels the half right there, so I didn't bother writing 2 divided by 2 or 2 times the half. So once you have the derivative, I just rewrote the negative half power as 1 over square root. And then fractions suck. Well, I'm setting equal to 0. And then fractions suck, so multiply by a denominator. That's not how you make a fraction equal to 0. The denominator is not really relevant. So we'll get the denominator out. How do we solve for y now? So we're going to factor out a 4y. So we get 4y times 2 minus y squared. So we have three potential y values that make this equal to 0. What is the first y value? Zero. 0, that's obvious. What's the next one? Negative square root 2. And the last one? Square root 2. So those are the three that make it 0 right there. Any questions on those three? So we're not going to actually, there's not three rectangles that have maximum area. There's one rectangle that has maximum area, but we have three answers, so let's think about them. All right, y equals zero. What type of rectangle has a height zero? A line, it's kind of boring. Let me draw that rectangle for you. It's this really wide one that has height zero. That's not a maximum, that's actually a minimum right there that has zero area. So that's out. Also, we put some restrictions over here. We said don't make y zero. So either way, y equals zero is out. What about y equals negative square root two? That would be our really badly drawn rectangle in the bottom half. So that's out. We also said y greater than zero up here. Or wait, yeah, y greater than zero, so that's out. All right, last one makes sense. Small value, positive. Looks good. So we're going to go with this guy. That's part of the answer. The other part of it is the dimensions. So how do I get x value? Somewhere is it good? Here we go. x equals square root 4 minus y squared. That's right. So x is, oops, I don't need to write x a second time. So we have square root 2 squared. Can you just take the 2 out? Uh, the 2 out. So the square root underneath the square root. Yeah, like that. That's Because okay. uh, 4 minus 2 is 2, so square root 2. All right, so x happens to be the exact same value. And last, what is the area? We said it was 2xy, which is 2 square root 2 square root 2, and that is 4. If you want to write units, go for it. Well, 4 units squared, probably. It's an area. So you want to be careful on this problem. We got multiple critical values, but only one that actually made sense. So our 0, y equals 0, that was a critical value, but that would make the area 0, which we didn't want. And negative 1 would also make an area negative. We didn't want that either. So most of the word problems, whether they're related rates or optimization, are going to have values that make sense and values that don't. And really, optimization, you'll have to decide what are the bad values that don't make sense as answers. I think the only thing we have left is the mean value theorem. So we did 4, 1, 
Oh, 4-3. I better change my notebook around. All right, so I'll decide what to do with 4-3. All right, mean value theorem. <coughs> Let's talk about the theorems, the old theorems, the ones we've used before. So what are some big important theorems we've talked about? Uh, Sandwich. It's almost an H. Sandwich. There's no in the which there's uh, what's that? Oh. Sandwich? Yep. All right. Which, yeah. Value theorem. All right, there's one more theorem we're going to do now. So we have a new theorem, the mean value. All right, things in math are not nice, nor are they mean. They're neutral when it comes to their emotional impact. So what does mean refer to here? Average. So statistical measurement, average. So that's what your brain should be thinking. Average value theorem. Of course, intermediate one was one in between the two y values. You can get another y value. That was why it was called an intermediate. This one is mean value theorem or average. Now, where do we see average before? What followed? I don't teach a statistics class, so we didn't talk about averages adding up numbers, we call it average rate of change, is where it came from. So almost every time I brought up average, it was talking about average rate of change. So this is no different. We're talking about the average rate of change here. So of course we're going to be lazy. We're going to call it MVT. And this describes the, uh, something about the average rate of change. It's a lot like the intermediate value theorem, except it tells you there's a point whose slope matches the average rate of change. So that's what the mean value theorem says. So if I read a really fast summary. Whose slope equals the average rate of change. So drawing this out, if you have some curve between two points, we can talk about the average rate of change. So this is y equals f of x. M is average rate of change. So we'll go from A to B. What are the coordinates of, let's go with start point, the left point first. What is the Y coordinate of this left point? So the X coordinate is A. The curve is Y equals F of X. So what is the Y coordinate? f of a. So take this x value and f it. That's our y value right there. Left endpoint, x coordinate b, and what is the y coordinate? Take b and f it. So it's that f value at the number b. All right, average rate of change. You have to remember way, way back to everything you've ever learned 
about rates of change on lines. What is the average rate of change in terms of these two points? That's that'd be the average of the of that would be the midpoint right uh, there, which unfortunately is not not very related to what we're doing. Okay. Um, so it's B minus F there. Yep. So it's y two minus y one over x two minus x one. Oh. All right. So that should be familiar in your brain somewhere. And that's sub two not the second, right? Two. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I've written this rate of change, FB minus FA over B minus A. We've written that down a whole lot. And it just comes from the Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. All right, what does this say? There's a point whose slope equals the average rate of change. So here's the average rate of change. Can you find one point that looks like the slope is the same as that dotted average rate of change? So it'll be somewhere, let's say, right about, let's go with blue. Somewhere right about there. That has pretty close to the slope. Slope of there should match the average rate of change slope. That's the mean value theorem, what it means right there. What it means. The way to think about the mean value theorem. There can be multiple points. So really fast side note, if this is your rate of change, your function could do some crazy stuff like that. And you may actually get lots of points that have this property. There's not a minimum, there's minimum numbers one if you have mean value theorem. So you could have one or it could have a lot of times where it's crossing over. Now if you have lots of values, you're going to have to obviously switch concavities. There's a couple other implications that you have. So there can be lots of points that have this mean value theorem property. The mean value theorem just says there exists at least one. So let's write down the official version of the mean value theorem. So all of our theorems start out with a hypothesis. If, if our function y equals f of x is continuous on the closed inter interval a, b and diffable on the open interval AB, then there exists a C in the open interval AB such that F prime of C equals FB minus FA over B minus A. So that is the mean value theorem. So I try to write my theorems with one line, the hypothesis, and one line, the conclusion, or the A implies B. So it seems a little tedious to show your functions continuous on this interval and differentiable on this slightly different one. So if we use the fact that f diffable on the closed interval a, b implies f continuous on and on a, b. 
So we're going to use the fact that differentiable implies continuous. So if you just say your function is differentiable on the closed interval, it also means continuous on the closed interval. So if f is diffable on AB, then there exists C in AB such that f prime of C you can use either version the alternative version is a little bit has a stronger hypothesis so it's applicable in less a couple less situations so first example let fx equal x squared What does MBT say about F on the interval 0 to 2? So before we apply the mean value theorem, which is what they're asking, does the mean value theorem actually apply in this situation? Do we satisfy a hypothesis? We do. Why do we satisfy hypothesis? Yep, and why is that? So why is x squared differentiable? What type of function is it? Polynomial. So it's polynomial, so it is differentiable. <laughs> so it is a polynomial and thus diffable on, well, any interval, but specifically 0 to 2. So make sure that you say why. So why is it differentiable? All right, so what does the mean value theorem say? So we satisfied the hypothesis right there. We just wrote that down. So we're going to apply the mean value theorem. Yeah. The, so the mean value theorem wouldn't apply if there was even one point that you were not continuous at. Even if it was outside of the point where you were checking? No. In that case, it wouldn't matter. Okay. If, so you, the mean value theorem or the intermediate value theorem, they both have intervals that you're focused on. And so in the interval, you need this property to hold. So on, on here, we need to be differentiable, basically. Right. So if, if it was, you'd have to find the asymptotes, make sure they're out of where you're yes. checking, and then check. Yeah. With just using yeah, so if, if we got a rational function, I would have to say uh, there's no vertical asymptote between 0 and 2. In addition to saying, hey, it's rational and there's no vertical asymptote between 0 and 2. All right, so there exists a C such that F prime C equals, I'm going to write it out with B's and A's right now, and we'll switch to uh, 2's and 0's in a second. So f of b, so we'll write it out 
f of 2 minus f of 0 over 2 minus 0. So this is a square function, x squared. So we got 2 squared minus 0 squared over 2. So this theorem says there is a point whose slope is 2. So there is a C in 0, 2 such that uh, explain So this is closed. Let me use a different color pen. So that's closed interval. And this one is open. Was that your question? Yeah, even like in the, the generic theorem, we have continuous on bracket AB. So this one's closed? And that one's open? That's it. So you don't need your, you need your function to be differentiable, but not necessarily at the endpoints. So what could be happening is you have some really nice function in between your endpoints. So you have some nice curve like that, but maybe there's some sharp corners right here. I don't know why it switched to pink. But there are some sharp corners right at the end here. That doesn't mess up the mean value theorem. So your function is continuous, except it's not differentiable at A and B. But if you think of the differentiable property actually is a property at a point, but it talks about going a little bit to the sides of it. So I don't, the mean value theorem is unaffected by what happens outside of A and outside of B. So you need continuity. Uh, and you actually only need right continuity at one endpoint, and you only need right continuity at this endpoint, and left continuity at the other endpoint. Which, if you go back to continuity on a closed interval, that's what it means. So, whatever happens outside A and B doesn't affect mean value theorem.